Okay, can people hear me all right at the back? Yep. 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 Okay, good. Um, thank you all very much for coming along. Um, my name's Richard Dennis. I'm the director of the Australia Institute. And uh, today we're uh, uh, hosting a wonderful event. We've, uh, we've got David McKnight, the author of An Investigation of Political Power. Uh, and uh, next to him, we've got Senator Bob Brown. And uh, the, the format is I'm going to uh, uh, fire a few <laughs> questions at the two of them. And uh, at the end of that, there'll be a bit of time for questions from the audience. So uh, thank you very much to Manning Clark House for uh, having us here on a beautiful afternoon. Luckily, we we're a bit worried about the weather, but uh, it's worked out very nicely. Uh, and, and to Bridget and to Ben and to other people who helped get it organised, uh, thank you very much. And, and if you really like what uh, David and Bob are talking about today, then I'll just put another plug for David's book, which is, of course uh, you can purchase over there. So uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, without much further ado, I'll, uh, I'll put my first question to, to, to David McKnight. Um, David, well, the first question, I suppose, is uh, why, why did you write this book? I think for two reasons, really, because there's been quite a few biographies and studies of Murdoch and his media power, and most of them see him primarily as a businessman who has an interest in politics, but whose political interest really serves his business interests. And I don't think that's accurate at all. Um, he's the kind of guy who comes from a kind of, who's on a sense of mission, and his politics are very much aut autonomous, or at least a separate area from his business. To His critics often see him as a, a person motivated by greed and the accumulation of wealth. I think he's more complex than that, and politics are much more important to him than that. One example of that, and I might just go on a bit, Richard, people see him, he said once himself that murder, uh, newspapers should make money, that's what they're all about. And his critics think, well, gee, that, you know, that's pretty ruthless and hard-nosed. He subsidises a whole range of newspapers because they're politically important. I believe the Australian newspaper <coughs> is either is subsidised within the group, within the News Limited group. Uh, if you look at it, it's very few ads, big, uh, lots of journalists, very well-resourced newspapers. So politics, the book was partly to underline and to, to, to examine his politics as one particular thing. The other thing, and I will continue, is the nature of his politics. <coughs> People think, well, Rupert Murdoch, he's, he's a conservative, he's a right winger. It's much more interesting than that because his political beliefs are uh, ultimately come from Repu a strand within the Republican Party of America. Murdoch believes that the free market is an instrument for liberation of ordinary people. And it's an instrument by which ordinary people can overthrow elites. And the notion of elites <coughs> is very important in his politics. It's, it sounds crazy, uh, because if anyone's in a member of an elite, it would be Rupert Murdoch. But anyway, I'll, I'll end there. But that's, that's, his co politics are more complex than you might think. Um, well, exactly on that point, um, you know, I'm an economist. There's probably a few other economists around here today. It's often said, why should we worry about the media market? Um, if people don't like what they read, if they don't like the politics of what they read, then they can buy something else. I mean, why? Uh, there's plenty of shows on television I don't watch. Uh, there's plenty of food in the supermarkets that I don't buy. Why should I be worried if there's a newspaper I don't like? There's some elementary truth to that, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't dismiss the market. Um, it's, they find on current affairs show that when they put a politician on a current affairs show, the ratings drop immediately. And, <laughs> they, and well, it's, a, it's not a good thing, I don't think, actually. It's a sort of anti you, You'll get your theory. turn in a minute, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but the market rationale, I mean, if the market's all that matters, then think of it in terms of the hacking affair in, in Britain. Uh, if we say to something like that gross industrial scale hacking doesn't matter, it's just a matter of whether people want to read news of the world or not. The, the point is that there are all sorts of other values and, and ethics and ways of relating other than through the market. To say everything comes down to the market is, a, is an extraordinarily uh, emaciated view of what society and human beings are about. And there are laws and all sorts of other things. Um, Bob, can I bring you in here? I mean, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of yourself as a politician, even though David's just had a go at them, um, uh, yourself as a politician, but also as as 
as uh, there's, there's, the, there's the campaigning for votes and there's making laws. So both as a politician and as a regulator, um, how 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 do you see the, the, the role of the media and, and the need to regulate it? I mean, obviously we've got the extreme examples of the um, uh, we've got the extreme examples of phone hacking in the UK, but then of course we've got the uh, the famous editorial in the Australian soon after the last election saying, you know, it was the role of the Australian to get the Greens out of Parliament. Yes, the the um, the media is critically important. It's the fourth estate, and uh, as Ralph Nader said to me in Launceston in 1980, information is the currency of democracy. But of course, uh, it's the quality of that information that leads to the quality of the democracy. And we've got uh, in David's book the example of the Sun newspaper in London claiming victory in swapping governments, front page. Uh, and there's no, look at today's Courier Mail everybody, I suggest you don't buy it or go to Brisbane to get one. But on the front page is an opinion poll which shows the Greens on 9% and the Catter Party on 8%. Um, I hope I've got that right, Bob. The Cata Australian, whatever it's called, <laughs> properly registered party. But when you go to page 12 to look at the policies so that you can work out how you're going to vote, there's Labor, the Liberal National Party, the Cata Party, no Greens. Uh, and by exclusion, this is censorship being practiced by the Courier Mail for the Queensland people. They've got no option uh, when it comes to seeing what the policy lineup is. It, um, it's, it comes out of this extraordinary concentration of the media that there is in Australia with 70% of the papers in the capitals coming out of Murdoch presses and uh, Rupert's own and I think uh, this book um, both brilliantly but also very troublingly uh, shows how his own zeal for having his ideas, he says he's a man of ideas and it's those ideas that he wants to get out through the media. It's not just profit, it is his ideology that he wants to get out through the media. Now, we, we take it that a healthy media in a democracy is about informing the public. Uh, but he sees it as uh, converting the public to his way of thinking. Very, very big difference. And the second one is quite dangerous. Uh, particularly in places where there is no opposition, there's no alternative, and particularly where you've got a suborned media, as you have in Australia, uh, which no less uh, than the political establishment is frightened of taking this on, of tackling it, of analysing it, and that's why this book is critically important, and I think uh, very important to anybody who wants to understand how politics works and doesn't work in Australia. And Bob, I mean, on that, we've recently had the uh, the Finkelstein inquiry into into the media and uh, uh, the media's reaction to its um, uh, to its recommendations. You could only describe as um, hysterical. Well, I could only describe as hysterical. Um, uh, how is how as a politician who's got concerns about media power? How can you do anything? How can you inform people about that except through the media? And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we can organise a few more events like this, but uh, what's 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 the plan? How do we get Australians to understand the media when we actually rely on the media to explain things to people? Well, it is a catch-22, but organise uh, events like this are, are critically important. Um, I found when we signed the Green signed the arrangements for government with Julia Gillard's Labor team, um, rather than Tony Abbott's. Liberal National Party team in 2010 and came out to make that announcement, uh, I found a ferocious questioning of that by f no less than four people from the Murdoch media, one after the other. And then it, in, in consequent uh, press conferences, realised that this was quite or orchestrated. They'd throw one to the other. And uh, it didn't matter what the topic of the conference was, it was the topic they wanted to run on the next day with a lot of verbling going on that that was being forced. And one day I came down from a committee meeting and this was going on and I took them on um, early last year. And um, there was quite a reaction to that. Uh, but um, here I am, uh, this is a democracy. We are free to take them on. 
But I think we're all, I think, uh, and I'm talking here about politicians, far too supine about the media. And I've had a senior minister in recent years say to me, with a huge announcement about Australia's future, if I don't feed this to the Telegraph or, or the Australian in the lead up to it, I can't say that I'm going to get a good press. And when I saw the Prime Minister walking up the stairs in Sydney last year, to be greeted by the news media personnel, Mr. Hartigan, at the top of the stairs, uh, as if you know you're entering a, a temple of all power, and even the prime minister has to get out of a car with televisions going to walk up those steps. Well, I, I've never had an invitation from Rupert. You know, I, I sit by my letterbox um, and, and uh, would welcome him to. I, I have had the editor of uh, the Australian through no less than three journalists last year say that he would like to meet me. And on each occasion I've said to him, well, here's my number. He's welcome to come and see me any time. And he never has. And I presume this is because the hubris of the Mur Murdoch empire is such that politicians go to see them when it gets to executive level. It's not the other way around. Well, I'm not into that. Uh, I'm just one who's quite happy to sit by the letterbox and wait. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, David, I mean, on that, I mean, and to some extent, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the whole point that you're making in the book, but how, how comfortable is Rupert Mur Murdoch in, in wielding political power? How, uh, how familiar is it uh, to him? And, and as Bob's just alluded to, how structural is that sort of expectation? Well, it goes right back into his life. I mean, in 1963, he broke into the Sydney market, bought the Daily Mirror, and at around that time, got to know Arthur Corbell. Most people today have forgotten Arthur Corbell. He was the leader of the Labor Party in the early 60s. That put him on, I think it became a bit of a, a bit of a drug, a bit of a, in a metaphorical sense, that, that he was mixing. He found that, and his father would have told him, if you have a newspaper or a series of newspapers, politicians really respect you. They want to talk to you. They want to be on your good side. Um, just picking up on what Bob said, I mean, it was Tony Blair who came out to a big news corporation conference in Hayman Island in 1995. Bruce Guthrie, the editor, former Murdoch editor, said that he saw John Howard in the 80s, when Howard was opposition leader, in, uh, in the anteroom of Murdoch's office. And Howard's hands were shaking so much he'd spilled a gl glass of water. You saw Kevin Rudd go to New York to meet Murdoch. I mean, this, go, this is deeply symbolic and important, that they go to him. He doesn't come to them. And uh, in terms of the, the, the media's reaction, in particular the, the News Limited reaction to the Finkelstein rep, um, uh, recommendations, I mean, uh, are there examples from in other countries where people have sought to regulate to try and limit the kind of power, or is Australia kind of unique in that no one else has probably got 70% newspaper ownership? Difficult question, Richard, because I haven't studied media regulation in other countries. I mean. I think what you can say about the reaction, and it's been an extraordinary reaction, I mean, is this, is this hysterical? Um, there was a very good article by a guy called Sam North, who's a former managing editor of The Herald, and it's one of the few articles which said, look, let's calm down here. I mean, this is lots of sections of uh, business are regulated by the big bad government, government funded under statutory controls, lots of sectors of society. Uh, what's so different about the, the media? The actual media council that, uh, that is going to do the regulation, half of it has to come from the industry. It's not some, it's going to be some anonymous bureaucrat in Canberra. You know, I mean, it is very precious. I think it's very romantic to, for journalists and, 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 and editors to see themselves in some heroic mode fighting a big bad government that's determined to take away their power. I mean, <laughs> there's been regulation in the television industry on similar kinds of lines or under law, has there been a takeover? Of, I mean, television is licensed by governments. There is no government control of, tele, of Channel 9 or Channel 7. It's, it's absurd uh, and, and it is quite hysterical. Um, just putting on the spot here because I, I, I don't think you've thought about this at all, but um, uh, one of the more visible campaigns that uh, particularly the Australian ran in recent years was the campaign against the proposal for a Charter of Rights, which, in terms of Murdoch's politics of freedom and individualism, seems 
you know, a bit odd. Listening, it only just occurred to me then, you know, there they are raging against government regulation of potentially freedom of speech. Mm. Yet when there was a proposal to enshrine some form of charter yeah, well, the, rights... The problem, they... Richard, is that you expect consistency. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, when, when senior people and owners of media talk about freedom of the press, I guess there's one part of them that is sincere, but a lot of it is their commercial freedom. That is what they're talking about. You know, there is some overlap there, I mean, but, but really, they're talk they don't like regulation. I mean, one of the... I think the, one of the most acute statements about News Corporation, and it was as a result, bouncing off the hacking affair, is that the culture of the organisation is a culture of contempt for rules and contempt for governments. That's the sort of bottom line. That's where it starts. That's why you have something like hacking occurring. And so when that kind of corporate culture meets a judge and, and who's decided that, or who, who is prescribing suggesting some re form of regulation, there is such an extraordinary reaction. Um, well, that's probably not a bad segue into something that's probably of interest to a lot of people here. You've got a, a chapter on this, obviously, is, is, is climate change. I mean, uh, again, it always strikes me that conservatives, uh, you know, the whole point of conservatism is to keep things the way they are, are so radical when it comes to a threat like climate change. How, how do you interpret the, the, the quite mixed, but, uh, but certainly the most visible part of uh, the Murdoch press has been um, uh, sort of rabidly concerned with addressing climate change. How, how do you reconcile that? How do you, uh, in terms of, as I said, you know, the, his, his broader approach, is it the contempt for, for government? Well, there's so many things you could say about that. I mean, there is a history of denying science in News Corporation, the Sunday Times and other newspapers in the 90s. Uh, proposed a campaign or ran a campaign that there was no link between HIV and AIDS. This was just the politically correct views of a medical elite, they said, which is the similar kind of riff to what they say on climate change, that, that really it's just a, it's a political issue, really, and it's not a scientific issue. Um, you know, the, the Australian can, with a straight face, say, well, the science is not settled. The evidence for global warming is, is quote-unquote, equivocal. I mean, this is madness and in the face of such a radical threat. I mean there was some hopes lifted in 2007 when Murdoch himself for a brief period adopted a position that climate change was real, that it quote posed catastrophic threats. Uh, that's now gone as I point out in the book. Uh, it, recently in New York he said oh well it's really to do with activities of the sun and that is a classic skeptic argument. Did he mean the newspaper? He didn't mean the newspaper, that's right. No, he meant whatever it is up in the sky. Um, Bob, how, how much harder does it make uh, your job in terms of uh, trying, to, uh, trying to lead a public debate on an issue like climate change when, there is a, when there's a proudly campaigning newspaper that you know, proudly campaigns for uh, yeah, a rather unscientific approach to, to these issues? Well, really, it brings us into focus as Greens because um, we're not to be deterred by that scepticism, and it's a very dangerous scepticism that um, is captured by the majority of the newspapers coming out because uh, they're owned by the Murdoch Empire, and in turn, that influences the ABC, and um, uh, which has had a lot of sceptics uh, on programs both on TV and radio, which would not have been there had it not been for the flow on effect that comes from the, the Murdoch Empire. I don't say don't have um, Lord Monckton on, uh, late line it's, and so on, but um, there has to be a reality check on that and we're on a, on a planet with extraordinary problems and uh, I think Rupert Murdoch did for a couple of years, he did look at it, he, he, uh, he was changed, as you say in your book, the um, the whole empire says it runs on a carbon neutral basis uh, and yet there's scepticism uh, and uh, it's quite extraordinary and very, very dangerous because we don't have a plurality of, of points of view and exclusion is, the, is one of the strongest weapons that's used by the Murdoch media, not running the story, not running the, uh, the preponderant scientific point of view preponderantly. Uh, read that opinion 
uh, you know, the Janet Albrechts and, and the Piers Ackermans and, and, and the, what's his name Andrew from The Bolt. Sun, Andrew Bolt. Um, uh, they, they're rabid um, and they have a point of view which is uh, steeped in assertion of oneself rather than the good of the future or, or the wider humanity, let alone our fellow species on this planet, which is now seeing extinctions at the greatest rate since the dinosaurs went west 65 million years ago. Uh, but this is where the Greens come in, and uh, there's a, you know, the more the big parties are restrained from taking a reasonable scientifically based response to climate change uh, and to a whole range of other issues, the more the Greens become attractive to those people who are very worried about it. And the one thing the Murdoch media can't do is dumb down the intelligence of the electorate. We have a growingly interested, informed, intelligent and concerned people right around the planet. And I think that's defeating, I think it's self-defeating for the Murdoch media to simply uh, be saying, no, what Rupert says is what's good for the planet. And it is as simple as that. And it is very dangerous. I saw this with a media mogul in Tasmania who um, became so um, full of his own hubris. He ended up, um, in that case, trying to bribe somebody to cross the floor of parliament against the Greens in 1989 and ended up in jail. And the whole empire fell as a result of it. Because breaking the rules seemed to him a reasonable thing to do for the outcome of getting back in a conservative government. And um, we're seeing quite a lot of the rules being broken in London at the moment. And I don't, I reject the idea it can't happen here or that it hasn't happened. Uh, that sort of rule breaking hasn't happened in Australia in the past. This is one empire with a extraordinarily strong personality at the top. And uh, uh, you know, just on the old rule, the person at the top has to take some responsibility for what's happening down the line. Uh, it's surprising that so far Rupert Murdoch has um, uh, escaped his responsibility and not taken his responsibility for what uh, has been happening in Fleet Street, uh, to use that general term, um, under his watch. Um, I want to move on to sort of what some of the emerging trends and what we can do next. But before I do, Bob, in a you know, as a as a Tasmanian senator, Tasmania's probably got one of the more concentrated media markets in the country. I mean, how uh, can, have you got any examples of what uh, what a one paper news what a one newspaper town uh, you know what it can be like well, to live in one? Well, David's book um, points to an example of global interest which is the run to the Iraq war, where an editorialist in uh, the Mercury, in, owned by Murdoch, it's a one newspaper town, uh, a couple of editorials were run uh, saying, hang on a bit here. Um, we shouldn't just be doing what the US says. We should be uh, evaluating this before we go to war, war in Iraq. And uh, a call came from Sydney and the, the writer was put over there and the paper fell into line with the 175 other papers around the world, all writing pro-invasion editorials. And I know because uh, I spoke to the writer of those editorials at that time. And um, it, that was a direct phone call. It usually doesn't require a phone call. People uh, know what the boss thinks. But that's a clear example of where Tasmanians were being given uh, an editorial line coming from outside. Now, um, beyond that, I don't think the, Merc the Mercury figures very high in, in um, uh, Rupert's thinking. But, um, you know, uh, it would be, it would be um, much better if we had a, a greater diversity of papers. I'm, I don't think the, conser uh, the, the Mercury is by any means the worst in the Murdoch stable. In fact, I think because it's close to the community, it has to run uh, a bit more with the time. We do get um, Piers Ackerman shoved down our throats. Um, and uh, as a, a regular column, you know, being written from Murdoch Central in Sydney uh, and, a, and a few others. But um, 
it's perhaps the least worst example of uh, the Murdoch Empire in full flight. David, why um, uh, was was the war in Iraq that important to Rupert Murdoch, or was it just such a clear example of sort of uniformity? And as as Bob said, you know, 170 papers around the world all sharing a subconscious conscious. Well, it was very important to Rupert Murdoch, I mean, to understanding him, because I think most people would remember back that the group within the Bush administration that was really pushing the Iraq war, that, that wanted to go to war with Iraq within days of the 9-11 uh, terrorism attack, were, were collectively known as the neoconservatives, the neocons. Murdoch had been funding them for the previous 10 years. In 1995, he'd bought and, or set up uh, their, their influential magazine in Washington. I mean, this is a sort of hidden little bit of history that, and, and their view was uh, right from those days that, that Saddam Hussein had to go, which is not a bad thing in some ways because Hussein was a monster. But it, in the most opportunist kind of way, it, it, they, after 9-11, they said, oh, well, it's really, they began to invent this, this connection between Hussein and Al-Qaeda and so on. And this was... Uh, propagated by Murdoch's newspapers. The Australian had articles about how really Saddam Hussein was in, in league with Al-Qaeda, etc. It all, the we of course, when we know about the weapons of mass destruction that never existed. But this was pushed all over the world uh, by, Mur by decision of, of Murdoch's newspaper. And, and with, you know, $1 trillion, I think it is, the Americans spent, up to 100,000 lives. I mean, this is not just an idea that's being propagated. It, had, it has consequence. It had consequences. David, you referred before to um, uh, the fact that some some Murdoch newspapers uh, clearly cross subsidised by other ones. Um, that suggests that keeping them keeping them up and running is uh, is an end in and of itself. There's a lot of concern in Australia at the moment about the, the impact of, uh, of, of of basically the internet on the economics of newspapers. Do you think that um, uh, all those potential new conduits of information? Are, are a threat to the Murdoch Empire, which you know is pretty well grounded in old-fashioned newspapers, or is a willingness to underwrite loss-making mm. newspapers the potential to make him the last man standing? Look, I'm a, a great fan of the internet, and I think probably like everybody here, I I use it and all the time. I use databases, and, and it's wonderful. And there are there are indeed we've seen in the Arab Spring the way in which. A sort of horizontal communication that doesn't go through gatekeepers can be a powerful force. And that is, well, there's two things to say about th that effect. One is that the advertising base of newspapers is basically being destroyed. And one of the consequences of that is that the people who will own newspapers in perhaps 10 years' time will have other agendas other than business. And the evidence for that is very clear. We can see it in, happening in front of us with Gina Re Reinhardt and Clive Palmer talking very well, in Reinhardt's case, buying 12, 13% of Fairfax for, for not, for, it's not a business investment. This is not a, and she doesn't even pretend it is. Uh, this is what will happen. Now, why does this matter? Newspapers, okay, everybody says dead trees, legacy media, newspapers don't matter. They matter very much because all kinds of studies have shown that they set an agenda for the rest of the media, for radio, television, and for online. I mean, if you go looking for the thing called online news, it mostly comes from two sources, public broadcasters and newspapers. That's where online news comes from. And so newspapers have always been strategic in politics and they, they are still strategic and that is one of the reasons that Rupert Murdoch, there's a bit of a division within the Murdoch families with, with James and others hinting that perhaps the newspapers should go. They're too much trouble because of the hacking stuff. Murdoch understands that they are crucial in exercising political influence and it's political influence on governments and they control a great many things including television licences. Well you've done more than most to um, uh, try and save a few trees and stop people uh, turning trees into paper. How do you feel about the potential demise of tens of millions of pieces of newspaper getting spread around the country every day? Well in terms of cutting trees um, and the plantations these days that wouldn't um, that, that of course would be a good thing because we do have to reduce the um, massive impact we're having on resources and be better if those trees grew and absorbed some carbon. 
uh, instead of being um, taken into a factory and, and, and printed with carbon. But um, I, I, the analysis that David's just given is true. Um, we don't know whether the newspapers are going to really disappear. Uh, and if they are, um, it's going to be um, the same concerns will translate across to the internet. And, you know, Rupert uh, and other uh, media empires are trying to find ways of, of establishing the same sort of power they have uh, through the internet that they've had through the printed press. And one of, the, one of the things we'll have to watch very carefully there is in an age of... Um, there'll, be, there'll be increasing pressure on politicians to um, agree to what the corporations want against the public interest in uh, regulating. It's a very interesting um, swap here. Don't regulate us when it comes to setting up a media council, which simply says... And this, this uh, Finkelstein proposal is simply to have the journalist code of ethics implemented. That's all. No, that's a horror. That that's a fascism, authoritarian, totalitarianism, etc. Uh, but you watch um, people like uh, Rupert Murdoch move uh, as best they can in the coming years to have the great uh, cyberspace brought under the control. Uh, the commercial interest, and, and, but ne inevitably the political uh, suasion sway uh, of uh, those people who've got the money. And I think uh, Gina Reinhardt, is a, it's a very troubling example of what's happening with the newspapers, but we have to worry about where that will follow through into the internet in the years to come. Um, we'll throw to questions from the, the audience in a minute, but uh, I'm just interested to hear briefly from both of you uh, what, if at all, you think about um, uh, Clive Palmer's idea of a blind trust, where where he and some of uh, some of his billionaire friends might harmlessly own the media. It's very public spirited of him. But <laughs> I've got a few suspicions about it. I mean, in, on paper, it sounds like a good idea. Perhaps Gina Reinhardt should adopt it and put all her 12% of Fairfax in a blind trust. But uh, I would think that there are other ways of, of influencing. If you if you really end up owning a very large stake of something like a newspaper chain, I, I can't imagine if you really want to, you couldn't get around those kind of arrangements. I mean, there are directors of the company, for instance, and the appointment of editors is crucial. So it's not just a matter of having some sort of separation like that. Maybe you should just give a few million to the ABC and SBS. <laughs> well, I, I thought maybe he could run billions of dollars worth of ads, you know, for himself or for mining or, or something else, inject a bit of money in. Um, look, uh, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll come to questions in a minute, but I, I suppose uh, my last question to both of you is, is sort of the where to from here on, on the regulations. We've talked a bit about the Finkelstein, and we've talked a bit about the reaction, and. Uh, from my point of view, I suppose the tobacco industry didn't like regulation, and uh, the, the, the you know the greenhouse gas emitters didn't like regulation, and uh, the petrol companies didn't like it when we took lead out of petrol. Should we be so surprised that the media are resistant to regulating, you know, their industry? Um, but uh, if if not, um, you know, where to from here? Is is what Finkelstein suggested enough? Is it a good first step, or um, you know, has he gone too far? Well, uh, as I said a bit a while ago, it's simply imp implementing their own charter, their own uh, moral document for proper behaviour by journalists. And it doesn't have any jailing or, or, or fining capacity. You, you know, people, uh, other people would have to go to the courts if uh, one of their findings was not upheld. It's quite extraordinary. We had a referendum to see whether we'd keep the Queen or not. And I think there'll be another one down the line about head of state. The, the media itself keeps the body politic under constant surveillance, and, and that's a good thing. Um, we've just seen inquiries into defence, which have created a big ruckus. The churches open to inquiries and um, and, and on and on it goes. There is no area, uh, and, and if, as you said, David, the electronic media has ACMA, which um, does much. It's a, it's a bit toothless, but uh, it has the potential 
to look after the public interest. But when it comes to the printed media, no. It's, it's quite an extraordinary thing because uh, the media, the print media itself, is in pursuit of inquiries every, every day of the week into everybody else, but none the other way. It's quite a, uh, an ex, an ex, a precious point of view from uh, the... And I, I, I am amazed that there aren't more ethical, high-minded, resolute, strong backbone journalists who haven't come out and said it would be a good thing for our whole camp if we had a regulator who saw our journalist code of ethics and said, stick by that. Otherwise, what's the point of it? Just in terms of where to from here, I, I, I'd pick up on something Bob said earlier, which is that politicians are bluffed by the media in, in some cases. I don't mean to diminish Murdoch's power or the power of, of, of media to set an agenda. But if you think back in the last 20 or 30 years, every progressive movement that has ever arisen, risen, including ones that Bob's been personally associated with, in, with, with logging, the women's movement, all kinds of movements have had a hostile media, and they've still won. They've still won. I mean, media power is not absolute, and that is, that's an important thing to realise. And it is quite possible for if you take initiatives, if you do good things. I mean, if you look at the coverage of federal politics and the way it's been transformed through the breakthrough that the Greens have made, it's very good. It, it, it shows if you take initiatives, if you, if you have other voices, you can, with all the distortion that has happened and the, and the hammering that the Greens have got, they have helped change the debate in the real world. So media power is not absolute. So where to from here, I guess, is to try and build those progressive movements uh, to, to push aside the kind of hostility and poor reporting that they get. Okay, uh, your turn. Uh, I'm just going to set the microphone up here, so if people want to ask a question, maybe um, just make a bit of a cue. Very, very shy. <laughs> there you go. And if we can keep questions short, that'll be good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, you might have to hold it in your hand, perhaps. Okay, thank you for coming today and um, having such an interesting discussion. I'm a very naive observer, but what I'd, I'd like to know, and I don't know if you can answer this, in the context of the discussion today, I'm really amazed that the boat people are still on the agenda, given the small numbers and the other huge issues that face Australia at the moment. Why are politicians letting this take over the agenda of politics, if you like. Does that make sense, that question? Like, why are we still talking about that when it's such small numbers? Well, I think um, you'd have to ask the media about that. Um, and we have to um, say, yeah, why is it that there's such concentration on people coming here in small numbers in boats when they're coming in much larger numbers in jets? Uh, one difference there is that if you're in a boat, by and large, you don't have a wallet with you. If you're on a jet, you have $250,000. You can legitimately come to the country and become a, an Australian um, because that's the way the law is written. So we do live in a, a, a world where wealth counts. And um, it's ex it, uh, you know, the, the boat people issue became a big one only after... Uh, really the Twin Towers and the invasion of, of Afghanistan and then the invasion of, uh, of Iraq. And I can't help but think that the extraordinary prominence it, it was given then and has continued through to now was as a foil for the huge mis error that was made in um, invading Iraq um, under false pretenses with the awesome consequences, uh, including 100,000 lives, that uh, David's spoken about. Um, there's there's a relationship there. It's it is a dog whistle matter. Um, John Howard used it well, and since then uh, Labor's used it, uh, and, and they're in a contest to see who can keep um, the people who 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 have to um, for their own aspiration to get somewhere to safety and to some future get into boats? Uh, it, you, it's a very good question and um, I find it extraordinary but um, 
No other country in the world has quite reacted in the way that uh, Australia, Australia has. And Australians are good-hearted, generous people. But fear is a huge motivator. And um, the old par parties um, and the media have used it uh, quite unmercifully. Well, I, I agree with Bob, but I, but I think there are deep reserves of, of uh, insecurity and uh, tinged with racism in Australia. The point is that politicians give the lead. They press that button. Howard did it and, and Abbott's doing it. And, and the media, to some degree, reflects that. To some degree, they like to whip, whip it up themselves. But, you know, the problem is real out there in the community and it's politicians' lack of leadership or the particular opportunist kind of leadership they give that they can use it, as Bob says, for fear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment. I think there's one newspaper in News Limited that didn't fall into line over the Iraq war, uh, and that was the Post Courier in Papua New Guinea, um, without any sanctions being taken against it. Um, question for you, David, uh, would be, you say you don't really recognise the Rupert Murdoch from many of the earlier biographies. Um, could part of the reason or a possibility be that Rupert uh, Murdoch has changed somewhat? Uh, that is to say, the Rupert Murdoch of Hugh Lund's biography may not be the same Rupert Murdoch as your biography. Um, and in what ways do you think he's changed over time? Well, I think he's become more political. I mean, I think in some ways the late 90s saw the creation of Fox News in the, in the US. Uh, a little later, the, the build-up to Iraq. I think, if anything, he's become more and more entrenched. But I think the earlier biographies were, were dazzled by his business deals. And as a business person, uh, whatever qualities that takes to be successful, he is extremely successful. Uh, and, and so I think those biographers were, were pretty dazzled by it. And, I mean, there's a crude fact that you know, there is a market for business biographies. And so the his uh, deals were, were the centrepiece and, and the politics was seen as an adjunct to all that. Uh, I badly want to meet Rupert. I mean, um, <laughs> I'll get into trouble. I tried. Uh, you tried. I, I tried. I'll get into trouble for this, um, but, uh, you know, I see some, um, some parallels with myself. Uh, he's 14 years older than me. He ca caught an earlier bus. Uh, and, um, you know, that's just the way things are. But um, it would be... I, I'd find it fascinating to talk with him. And um, I think uh, maybe he's a little... Uh, maybe he's a little concerned himself. Uh, John Howard may have been frightened to go to see Rupert Murdoch. I think Rupert would be a little bit alarmed to come and talk with me. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and I say that seriously because I think he knows that there is something about what the Greens are putting forward in economic, employment, uh, environmental, uh, social um, policy which is cohesive and which is attracting people. And he knows, by the way, that it's attracting um, um, a disproportionate number of, of people who um, ha are thinking about where the world's going to. And he must be doing that as well. And uh, it, it'd, be, uh, it'd be a great thing. Um, I mean, the minute I get a, uh, I'd like to catch up with you, message from Rupert, um, we'll tango. <laughs> Don't settle for Chris Mitchell on the Australian. Well, uh, uh, so Chris, Chris can come and see me any time he likes. <laughs> I, but uh, yes, I, I want to see the real thing. Thank you for your talk and thank you for being here. The, the um, Murdoch media can't be all bad. They do publish occasional letters of the editor that I write. Question for both speakers um, and sort of a contrarian question. Um, we can beat up or complain about or be afraid of the Murdochs and the Reinhardts and the Palmers and everybody. On the other hand, don't we as consumers of the media have some responsibility to consume a little bit of all different kinds of media, um, the lefty, the righty, the centery, the whatever, and don't we have a responsibility 
to help share our observations with others. In other words, isn't it not only their fault? Don't we have some responsibility as well? Well, thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the left media, where I can go and buy it. <laughs> but, um, that having been uh, said, uh, and we don't have a mass left media in Australia at all, um, uh, let alone a green media. Uh, but that being said, I, um, no, I d my last letter wasn't printed. It was about Mr Adani, the coal baron from India, who's going to open the world's biggest coal mine in the Galilee Basin in Queensland, which will produce more greenhouse gases when burnt in India than uh, the whole of the Queensland economy with all its new um, coal-fired power stations currently does. And I was just pointing out a few things and, uh, and I ended with the quote from Gandhi that the world has enough for everybody's need but not for everyone's greed. Now they didn't print this letter even though they had a two-page dissertation on, on Mr Adani in the business section of the Weekend Australian um, a couple of weeks ago. So I tweeted because the um, Australian had declared that I was the most powerful politician in Australia. And, uh, you know, quite a nonsensical thing. Uh, but part of their campaign to make it look like the Labor government is being in some way or other influenced uh, unduly by the Greens also elected to the Parliament. <clears throat> so I tweeted, how come the most powerful politician in Australia can't get his letter printed in the Australian? <laughs> well, the uh, letters editor was on the line after that, and, and they did print the letter, but they took out the Gandhi quote without asking. And, and that's, you know, that's censorship. And it's, uh, the biggest censorship is failing to, and I, you know, other people must have even greater trouble. But your question is, is um, valid in that, yes, we do have to, we do have to um, understand where other people, where Gina Reinhardt um, and uh, Clive Palmer are coming from. But that does not mean we have to agree with them. Nor does it mean we have to uh, exceed extraordinary power because they're billionaires uh, to them. Um, this planet, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, um, democracy is one person, one vote, one value, and it needs to prevail on the earth. And we're a long way short of that. And this age of massive wealth and the power that goes with it, with it it's plutocracy, and it's in very serious competition with democracy and may well get the upper hand. And um, that, that troubles me greatly, but understanding where they're coming from is very, very important if we're going to have democracy prevail. Well, I couldn't say it better than Bob. I mean, I think it is, of course, everyone's responsibility to inform themselves. I have actually enjoy sometimes reading right-wingers, people I disagree with. For that reason, if you... I mean, it, it, actually, I've been convinced on a few small points. They're too... They're too complicated to go through but to do with history and so on but it's important to understand people that you are critical of and who are critical of you I mean that is how a rich debate happens and I mean I think it was the Bible that said know thy enemy also so important to understand I mean that's partly what the Murdoch book is about. It also said judge not lest ye be judged. <laughs> <laughs> well there's limits on both of course. <laughs> I just um, wondered whether you thought Rupert Murdoch would bounce back from the hacking scandal with um, the launch of a new Sunday newspaper in the UK and his son stepping down from James stepping down from Fairfax, or whether it's done him untold damage. Look, um, Murdoch, I think, on some level, metaphorically, is unstoppable. I mean, he's opened the Sunday Sun to replace the news of the world. That was always the plan. I mean, this guy is not going to be shamed into retirement. And he's certainly not going to retire during the hacking scandal. Uh, that's not the kind of guy he is. This will be the last time, the, the last sort of occasion that he would do that. His big problem is he wants to, for someone who opposes establishments and opposes monarchies and elites, he wants to create a dynasty with his children in control. His biggest problem is that he can't step back from control of his uh, media empire. And this, this is very obvious. I mean, Lachlan tried 
uh, to run the joint and dad wouldn't really let him and James has tried and he's been shuffled off to, to, to the US and Rupert and his lieutenants in Britain uh, are running the, the, the counter, counter fight to, to hacking so uh, I don't think he's going to, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a person who really, you know, very hard to stop. He's got a hide as thick as anything. It's just interesting that Gina can't do it. Can't let go either. How serious is the damage that's occurred? And will it, in fact, lead to the politicians? Will it lead to the politicians in Britain actually bringing into account, uh, into effect, decent regulations? Will they see this as an opportunity to actually start putting in proper, more meaningful controls? I think they will. I, the question is, well, the question is, will politicians in Britain use the uh, instance of the hacking scandal to bring in better regulation and implied in the question is, will things really change in, in the relationship in Britain between politics and the media? I think they will. I mean, six months or eight, nine months ago, politicians were grovelling to executives who may well go to jail in the next 12 months or, or, or the next two years. The relationship between Murdoch's media in Britain and politicians has changed quite a bit. I don't know how long that will last, but there's been the, the, the politicians are running in the opposite direction to Murdoch's organisation, whereas before they were, in effect, supplicants wanting favours. So that's changed. But that hasn't happened in the US. It hasn't happened in Australia, that kind of dramatic change. And I don't, I don't think it will. Uh, his organisation fundamentally is still very powerful. It makes most of its money from television in the US. As, and as I've said before, it makes not a lot of money for, from newspapers. Yeah. Um, look, we'll wrap up in a minute, but um, uh, just before we go, is there, Bob, have you got any uh, last, uh, last thoughts or uh, suggestions for people? And, uh, same, same applies to you, Dave. No, I think this is a great discussion. Um, I, as I said, I'm, I'm bemused that the uh, the extraordinary attacks on the outcome of this media inquiry, setting, recommending that there be very modest um, councils set up with half the people coming from the media to serve the public interest of ensuring that the journalist code of ethics is upheld. Um, the attacks and the relenting and the amazing in the uh, demonisation and falsification of that outcome are quite extraordinary. Uh, the, you know, Rupert's been worried about communism, but some of those attacks would have done well in the old Soviet Union. And, um, and, I, and I mean that um, because it's true. Uh, the, and, and the lack of a public reaction in support of the Finkelstein inquiry outcome is equally remarkable. Uh, so one has to presume, even though the Greens will look at legislating if the government doesn't, uh, that um, if this continues, uh, it'll be put on the shelf. And I think that would be a great pity. I think it would be healthy for newspapers, uh, healthy for good journalists, and certainly in the public interest to have those findings enacted. But um, that, that really is in a democracy ultimately over to the public and I think there's a general uh, you good folk totally excluded but I think there's a general um, as long as maybe as long as the Wednesday specials are there in the papers who cares uh, and and it's a bit of a worry um, you know bread and circuses uh, we have to get beyond and we deserve better from uh, the media which is by the way what the the, the council's authority would be is largely to wrong uh, to right a wrong. When a story's wrong, when a person's misrepresented, when the rules are broken, that's corrected and corrected quickly. That's basically what it's about. It isn't about, uh, and never was about, uh, some politicians taking over the media and telling them what to write. But you'd swear it was if you read these <laughs> these uh, diatribes uh, coming from the, the um, media at the moment. So it's a troubling time because if this 
very reasonable, rational, minimalist watchdog of the public interest can't be established, what will be, whenever, in the future? I, I agree with Bob. I mean, I think there's a thesis, or a PhD thesis, or maybe several, in how the media has covered the attempted reform of the media. I mean, it's the least reliable way to get information about the media is via the mass media, particularly newspapers. I think, um, you know, people should, as I said before, I think it's, these media are powerful, but it's important. We don't live in a totalitarian society. It's up to everybody to write letters, to t lay complaints if they feel they've been wrongly reported, and don't let them get away with it. Um, you know, because when, if you're silent, then they take that as, uh, oh, well, there's not a really a problem. So I think, I think it's up to us, as well as, you know, launching critiques, which I'm happy to do, to, to also jump in and, and try and, um, and respond. All right. Well, um, well thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks to everybody for coming along. Uh, I'll just... Uh, David's too polite, but I'll, I'll give his book another plug. It is available over here for sale. Um, and uh, uh, the Australia Institute has put this on. We regularly run events like this, not, not as impressive as this, but uh, hopefully as interesting... Um, uh, particularly politics in the pub. If you're interested, uh, please uh, f just put your email address over there and we'll keep you posted. Uh, but um, in addition to, again, thanking Manning Clark House and, and Bridget and Ben and everybody who's made today possible, um, can I... <laughs> Someone... Sorry, I'm getting thank heckled by Ben. Oh, and Alice. Uh, <laughs> Alice, who uh, you know presumably made sure that uh, Bob and Ben got here on time. Um, uh, can, uh, can everybody uh, please uh, join me in, in thanking uh, David McCartney.